We're joined now by Catherine Fox. Catherine is a candidate for Scranton School Director, and she is cross-filed on both the Re Republican and Democratic tickets. Welcome. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. And we're going to jump right into the first question. And I always talk first about that which makes the world go round, and that's money. Equitable funding from the state continues to be an issue. Please share your knowledge of the issue and describe how you can impact this as a school director. Okay, thank you. Um, so just before, maybe within the last hour or so, I was actually on the phone with uh, somebody in the district and we're looking to write an op-ed together regarding the level up funding. So there was level up funding within Governor Wolf's budget and now there's um, it, it's not increased in, the, in this upcoming budget and such and we really level up funding um, helped the 100 lowest funded districts in the state and it, it put a band-aid on an issue but it did help and so we need that help to continue so what we're doing is looking to get the word out there that you know, let the public understand why that funding was so important to us and why we need it to continue. Overall, we need fair funding, um, but that is, you know, a battle that will take a long time. As you know, the um, the court um, issue happened, and it, it was seen that it is um, unfair, unconstitutional, that we're not getting the money that we need, but that will take a long time until we see the effects of that. So level up funding has really helped, and we need that to continue. Um, so I do, I'm, I'm a member of Pennsylvanians for Fair Funding since 2020, and it's a group across the state of Pennsylvania that gets together, um, writes to legislators, reaches out to people, writes op-eds, things like that. So um, I, I love the group. I've met a lot of wonderful people through it, and we really need that here in Scranton and that representation. Okay, thank you. The next question is equally important, pertains to safety for our kids. What is the role the school board plays in ensuring the safety of our children? Um, well, the school board is guided by policy and procedures, so we have to make sure that the proper policies are in place. Uh, we are members of uh, PSBA, the School Board Association, and they are always updating, uh, they're creating new policies and updating the ones that we have. So they help guide us to see where, where we ha might have some flaws, where we have holes. They're al always evolving, and um, that really helps guide us to see where we need to progress in terms of safety and security. And then it's just making sure that we always guide ourselves by those policies and procedures ourselves the administration and the district as a whole so that is where where we really our role is 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 looking at it from a policy procedure um, aspect and seeing constantly how we can improve and, and strengthen those okay <clears throat> the next one Catherine is a two-part question closing a school as you know is a hard decision to make yes so the first part is what factors should be considered when you have to vote on a closure and the second part is what factors should not be considered when you have to vote on a closure. Ooh, that's an interesting question. The two-part one throws me off a little bit because I appreciate that question because it, <clears throat> it does need to be acknowledged that it is a tough decision and that all factors need to be looked at. Um, I'm definitely huge on that and making sure that all information is in front of me before I make any decision, whether it's about a school closure or something small. Um, that's our, our role as elected officials is to have information from all sides before we make a decision. So uh, no one sitting in front of you should say, I will definitely do this or I won't do that because you don't have the information in front of you. So um, factors to consider is the impact on the students, number one, the teachers, the staff, and the community. So there's so many factors that play into something such as that. Um, for example, I went to Lincoln Jackson Elementary School and um, that unfortunately is no longer open, but I do see the impacts that it made on the surrounding community. I, I am grateful to see that the building is, is now on its way to being utilized, but um, you have to be realistic and that there's it's a ripple effect around it. So you have to weigh the pros and cons and then you have to go with what is um, in the best interest of everybody, staff, students, and community members. Um, what should not be looked at? Um, ooh, that's a tough one. I'm not even sure how I would respond to that because I don't think it hurts to look at any and all areas. Um, <clears throat> the only thing I would say to that is I, I know throughout my, my three years on the board, it's very difficult to take the emotions out of things. Very difficult. And I think not that you shouldn't look at the emotional aspect of it, but you just have to try to level that out with everything else. So maybe not let that have as much of an impact as the rest of the data and everything that you have in front of you. Okay. The next question is about transportation. And there's always lots of questions that come up about transportation. And I'm just talking about getting the kids back and forth to school. That's it. <clears throat> and again, a two-part question. 
Discuss any changes that you believe are needed to the district's policies on transportation for students. And again, what factors need to be considered when you're voting for such changes? Okay, thank you for that question. So I think this is an important question and we had a lot of things that came up about this when we were looking to make sure that the way we're transporting students aligned with our policies and we found out that they didn't always. We were transporting students that lived within the boundaries of, of what we were supposed to be transporting. And what I believe needs to be looked at is the state regulations of, so we get, we get money back for the students that we bus and we only get that, that refund back for the students who live within the, outside of the one and a half miles of the, of the building. And that is where we as elected officials and community members and school leaders can advocate to have that boundary adjusted. And so th it doesn't necessarily rely within our policy, which we can look at that more, but where the overarching problem is within the state. So if we advocate for that, it would not only help our students, but also other students in other districts. And that is something that I brought up when we were reviewing that subject previously, but there's so much that goes on all the time that I really do think we need to revisit it because I think that that would be important. We know transportation, if a student doesn't have it, they're, they're very likely not going to school that day or um, hope if it's an ongoing issue, it can impact their overall education and we never want that to happen. So um, we definitely want to provide as much transportation as possible. So we need to start at the higher up and go from there. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> this overall topic is on banning something. <clears throat> and again, a two-part question. So what should go into a process or a decision if a call to ban books or critical race theory or anything else is floated in front of the school board from whatever direction it might come from? What should go into your process as a school board member when you're making a decision about that? And then the second part of the question is, are these decisions up to the school board? <clears throat> That's an interesting question because thankfully there have been uh, many issues um, regarding things such as this across the, the country, but here in Scranton we haven't really had many issues regarding this um, as of this time. Um, but I believe this would just fall back to really any other decisions that we have as a board is looking at the whole picture and how it impacts every person involved. Um, and to that point is making sure that we're always staying in our places as board directors. We are not supposed to get involved in the day to day. We're not supposed to micromanage kind of, um, I think I'm sure you've heard it before. The, the reference is always up in our helicopter um, to make sure that things are operating as they should be. So, um, and let, once it falls down to policy or procedure or somebody not doing a job correct, then it would fall into our realm but other than that it would be you know up to the school administrators and such but um, when a decision such as that would come in front of us it's it's looking at the entire picture hearing everybody who has input listening to everybody and allowing everybody to give that input so for for any subject that we have come up <clears throat> I think it's critical to make sure that we give the public all opportunities to reach out to us you know we always tell them that they could come speak at the meetings and that they can email us but I, I think they don't always feel that they're heard in those what those avenues um, so maybe more public venues for them closer to their homes and such and not just one central location you know when we have something very important that directly impacts them just making sure that everyone feels heard okay thank you <clears throat> I have one more question oh, that was quick <laughs> I have a little bit of an intro on this one and okay. then I'll ask the questions <clears throat> okay <clears throat> excuse me per legislation that was passed in April of 2022 the Pennsylvania Department of Education must integrate culturally relevant and sustaining education competencies into educator preparation, so teacher preparation, induction, and continuing professional development no later than the 23-24 academic year. And there are nine competencies, and I'm not going to read them all because they have really long names, but they talk about cultural lenses, differentiated opportunities, culturally relevant learning, and things like learning about microaggressions. That's kind of the overall gist of it. So two questions for you. What impact does or will this additional training for educators have on our teachers and students? And what role will the school board play in ensuring compliance with this Pennsylvania law? Okay, thank you. Um, so this falls directly under like our collective, collective bargaining agreement. Um, there is uh, teacher in service days and onboarding in the beginning. So it's just making sure that this gets implemented. As you said, it needs to be pretty immediate. So um, it would be in our role just to be sure that within those in service days and such that this is included and um, just reading the legislation and making sure every, every checkbox is marked. Um, and, you know, I think 
anything like this is um, a way that we're moving forward. You know, th this comes about for certain reasons and it will only benefit our teachers, our students, and our staff. So just making sure that, you know, just like you said, this just recently came up and then there's always there's always new things that were are requirements of us. So just making sure as a board that we're following through with everything that we're supposed to um, so that we don't, you know, miss anything. All right. Unfortunately, that's all the time that I have for questions for you, but you will have two minutes for your closing statement. And I apologize because I forgot in the beginning to mention that you are a seated school board member now and you're running for re-election. And this is the first time you're running for re-election. Is that correct? correct? Okay. All right. So you have two minutes to speak to the voters about your platform, your campaign, any, any topic that you want to cover that we did not already. Okay. So yes, I was first elected in 2019 and my current term will be up in December. Um, I am hopeful to be successful to retain my seat. My daughter is in fifth grade at Northeast Intermediate School. My brother is in 11th grade at West High School and I graduated from the district in 2010. So um, the Scranton School District is my life. It's all, all of me. Uh, my father's one of 12. Um, him and all of his siblings went here. My mom and her siblings went here. Me and my five siblings, we all went here. So I'm definitely committed to the city and the district. <clears throat> I did work at Lackawanna College for seven years, but I recently transitioned to my family business National Bakery so you know that's a staple in the community too so I'm really grateful and glad to be so involved in the city and have my ways to give back and it's been a tough time it's been challenging but it's been so rewarding I really don't know where I would be if I didn't win election in 2019 because I just feel like this is who I am now um, it felt I, I was compelled to apply for a vacancy uh, twice before I ran for election and it just felt like it's where I was meant to be and now being in this role for three years, um, I, I know I've learned a lot and that is the plus to um, being an incumbent is there's such a learning curve when you have a $216 million budget and you have over 1,100 staff members, 9,000 students. So I finally feel very comfortable in my role. I'm always learning, I'm always growing, but <clears throat> I've definitely overcome those hurdles of understanding what is what. <clears throat> and I think that that is very important to continue us in moving forward. We need to keep moving forward. We recently did um, get out of recovery actually a year early. Um, we made history by doing that because in Pennsylvania, <clears throat> the first district to leave recovery, uh, it took them 10 years to get out. It's supposed to be a five year process. <clears throat> we left in four years and we are now in the monitoring phase and we are doing much better than we were, but we're, we're, we're not safe yet. Um, our general fund budget is only seven and a half percent of our budget, which it is supposed to be between five and 10%. I think people have a misconception that we're good and golden and, and we have a lot of funds to go around, but we have to be careful. We have to keep progressing forward and just do the best that we can for our students, our teachers, staff, and community members. All right, thank you. That ends our time with Catherine Fox. Catherine, again, is a candidate for election on the Scranton School Board, and she is cross-filed on both the Republican and the Democratic tickets, so voters of both parties will be able to cast their ballots for her on May 16th. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I appreciate it so much.